Museums offer memorable experiences for small children to adults. Designing those experiences is no easy feat. It takes an inside out approach. I'm Brian Nicodemus and with me is Bevan Savage Yamazaki. You may ask, what is inside out design? This is something that Art Gensler was a champion of. Essentially, it's a design approach that focuses on the building's interiors first and foremost. We look to find design experiences that ultimately link them together to tell a story of each building. When we talk to our clients, their chief concern is how do they fit in that design process and what does that process ultimately look like? What I tell them is it's a highly iterative process. It's highly collaborative, right? It's an energizing process where you participate in inside out design to find design drivers. Each project has a path to find out what it needs to be or who it needs to belong to. Ultimately, audiences, which are community-based, will determine how they belong to these spaces. That's right, Brian. And I think as designers, we really have an important responsibility to the communities that we design in, which really requires us to create a place in our design process for these community groups to really start to listen and to build partnerships, but also to create room for a range of voices and how these spaces are designed. So each process is really quite bespoke to that very particular project and community. And this, you know, we're really ensure that we can create these strong kind of inclusive interior spaces that drive the design of the building. Right on, Bevan. This is really what drives our passions, right? Inclusion and equity is becoming more of a design driver for our clients. One aspect that I'm passionate about is equitable access. And this often takes shape with meaningful diversity inclusion, but I want to talk about uh, a project's different approach to equity access in, in particular. It's the Hall Estate in Dallas, Texas at a Fair Park. It's home to the Dallas Historic Society. It was built in 1936, long before equity of access via Americans with Disabilities Act. People who had accessibility needs couldn't experience the building as able-bodied people could. What Gensler did is we seamlessly added an accessible entry that focused on their experience ascending into this building and experiencing that entry with dignity. Yeah, I think really ensuring all sections of our community feel like they belong in our cultural spaces is really essential to their success as a public space. Um, a similar similar sort of story in terms of kind of updating buildings. We recently completed the renovation of the Ford Foundation here in New York, and our client really wanted to shift the paradigm of philanthropic space and create a building that was really less about privilege and much more about transparency and this idea of of equitable experience. We created a new program for the public to come in with new art galleries, site-specific installations, an enhanced atrium garden that encouraged the community to visit and really engage with that space. But even more importantly, to ensure that that building met Ford's mission of believing in the dignity of all people. I think the success of that project is inarguable. Uh, how do we measure success when equity and dignity are project goals? Uh, it's not like an office building that has clean metrics and standards. It's much more inclusive. It starts often with a mission statement and oftentimes we'll incorporate a client's mission statement and we'll devise a visioning statement that helps the client and the team stay focused on those shared goals. Sometimes we look to precedents. At Gensler, we mine data. We're data nerds. Database design empowers our designers to tailor environments and empower people. And this data gives our clients the insight necessary to focus on their goals that might also include wellness or utilization in addition to equity and, and dignity. Yeah, and I think as many of our cultural institutions are sort of making their way back from closures and reduced visitation over the past two years, you know, we're really starting to see a real interest in the power of data to help these clients. It allows them to kind of really compare themselves with other like-minded institutions by using benchmarking, where we can study the amenities that, you know, different museums have, the size of their spaces, their front of house to back of house ratios, and really help the client make decisions that are back 
developed by data. And we know this, you know, we know the importance of a very carefully crafted and thoughtful architectural program because it helps to maximize the use of space, but it also really encourages operational sustainability. And especially for these clients, every dollar spent on your new building is a dollar less on your program. So that's where we're really seeing this great value of using data to make these smart, informed decisions. Right on. This this kind of model thrives with multiple stakeholders. Our clients often comment that they're surprised that their individual ideas had so much in common with their counterparts and they didn't have to compromise. And if there was compromise, they felt like they weren't giving anything up because it was a net gain when those ideas came together. Yeah, I, exactly. I think, as we said before, designing spaces that live in our public realm really requires a different approach, one that is bespoke, transparent and equitable, and really thinking about that inside experience driving the overall design of the architecture. You know, ensuring that we connect and engage with the community that we're designing in is our guaranteed way to ensure success for these cultural spaces. So it was great chatting with you today, Brian, and, and thank you all for listening um, on how we approach the design of museums and cultural space. If you would like more insights on museum design, please be sure to check out Genser.com for more on the firm's research and insights.